Hey, everybody. Thank you for taking the opportunity to join with me. Let's look today at chapter 5, episode 5, in this great story about Esther from the Bible. Last time we met, we looked and we saw how Mordecai was publicly and very outwardly, he was mourning because he got news of what the king had kind of been duped into writing in as a law that all the Jews could be killed on a certain day of a certain month. They could be plundered, all those different things. And so he was very distressed, as any of us would be, not only for our own sake, but for our families and for our kinsmen. And so he was out and had ripped his clothes, had clothed himself in sackcloth and ashes and was publicly mourning and grieving. And Esther heard about the commotion, what was going on. So she sent someone out to find out what had taken place. And then she discovers that this has been signed into a law. And Mordecai and Esther had talked together through messengers And uh, she had seen the writ that had been sent out, this decree to all the different places, the provinces that were under the control of the king. And so she knows that she's got to act and she's got to act, you know, quickly in order to try to save not only herself, but her people to sort of step up and use the position that God has put her in for the greatest good. And so uh, she realizes that there's a great possibility, as Mordecai points out, that maybe God had put her in the position she was in you know, for such a time as this, in order to act, that God had put her there so that this single act, you know, whether she lives or whether she dies, you know, this could be what God is seeking out of her life. And so we see here, we begin in chapter 5, it tells us this, On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. The king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request is, If I found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, Let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Now remember, Esther and those ladies that attend to her, uh, the the ones that, that minister to her and do her bidding, Esther has been fasting. And this is the third day. She's asked Mordecai to spread the word and to get all the Jews to fast on her behalf because she's going to go before the king and ask that something be done you know, to intervene. Now, we know that in their day and time, there was this custom, uh, this rule, this law, that if if he made a decree to the Medes and the Persians that it could never be retracted, um, it, once it went out, it was law and it couldn't be changed and he was bound by that. I happen to think that's a pretty silly thing and glad that most people and countries and things like that don't operate that way anymore, that things can be amended or changed or retracted or vetoed or whatever the case may be. But it goes to show you that it is important that we pay attention to what's going on around us and that we stay informed. Esther hadn't been given any contact with the king for like 30 days. And so she was risking her life by going before the king because if he didn't hold out the golden scepter to her, then she would surely die. That'd be the law. Nothing could be done about it. Now, we know that there are some neat things that have taken place up until this point. See, the king's already made a decree and lost a queen because he listened to some advisors. And so what I believe God was doing in that was all along, God was letting, you know, the king make these mistakes and sort of learn from some of them. Hopefully he would have, you know, continued to learn, but he'd already lost one queen. So he wouldn't be so quick to get rid of this queen and lose her. And so Esther's put in the right place at the right time after, you know, She's, she's coming after, you know, a predecessor that had suffered, you know, a wrongdoing and things like that. But uh, she's, she's coming in at the right time into the right position 
for such a time as this, because at some point in time, the enemy of the Jews is going to rise up. And in this story, it's definitely represented. It's Haman. He, he can't stand Mordecai the Jew. Mordecai doesn't bow down. He doesn't seem to like worship him every time he comes into his presence or anything like that. And so instead of just exacting punishment on Mordecai, he wants to take it out on all the Jews. Oh yeah, it's not good enough for him to just, you know, take it out on one person. He wants to take it out on all of them. So here's Esther. And the wisest thing she did was she decided she was going to fast and, and spend time in prayer and be ready spiritually for what she was going to have to do with her life. So whether she lived or whether she died, she didn't know, but she wanted to try to be faithful to do something for her people, for God's people, in fact. And so here she is. She's thrown this banquet, this feast, and in her wisdom, she's decided not to ask the king yet, but to delay it. So she comes before, what do you want, queen? I'll give you anything, even up to half of the kingdom. She could have asked, but maybe it was her womanly intuition. We don't really know, but she was wise. She threw a feast. She knew that the way to the king's heart was through this feast and through all these doings and everything. And she also includes Haman. Now I've thought and prayed long and hard about why she would include Haman in these proceedings. And some people say, you know, that they think that it's because she wants Haman to be there so he can be crushed or whatever the case may be, etc. But I think that she invited him from a place of humility, trying to have Haman be there but at the same time to try to smooth things up. If there's some issue between Haman and Mordecai that's caused all of this, maybe she can show humility and as queen show honor to him and respect and try to win him over. And we see that God has other plans and, and the way the story unfolds in this chapter and the next and as things go along. But I think that Esther's just trying to be humble. She's trying to be submissive. She's trying not to cause any more of a disruption than she has to but she's respectfully making her requests. And so she puts off the request, has another feast and says on the morrow, I'll do that. And so she's being patient. She's not rushing into anything, but she's being patient. And her patience gives God more time to work. So it all needs to happen. God could do it in an instant, in a moment, if he so decided. But according to this story, God's at work. And I believe God's guiding Esther into that position and how to be patient in all of this. He's providing a way for His people to survive. Why? Because God had made a promise to His people long ago. And if they're eradicated and destroyed here, then, then that would be the end of it. But God won't permit that to happen because God's going to make good on His promise. And His promise involves these people surviving. It might cost Esther her life. It might cost Mordecai, but the Jews won't be eradicated because God has made a promise to them. And so this is what happens beginning in verse 9. Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home and sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh and Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, Even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow also I'm invited by her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all the friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. you got to be kidding. Haman's so upset over this. He's joyful when he leaves the palace. He's been entertained by the queen at this feast. He's been honored in such a great way. Nothing but respect. And then he sees Mordecai and it's all out the window. He's upset. He's angry. He can't stand Mordecai, this Jew. He tells his family, he tells his wife, and they say, hey, let's make an example out of him. Let's have him hanged. So he goes to bed and rests easy. I've got a plan. I've had this gallows built. Mordecai will hang tomorrow and that will make me happy. Instead of enjoying the feast and enjoying the splendor, instead of receiving this 
humility from the queen and, and, you know, honoring other people the way he's been honored. All he can focus on is this fury, this anger. And in our story, we know that tomorrow at the feast, the queen is going to ask for them to be spared. But he's going to ask the king to kill Mordecai in the morning. Will God intervene in time? Will Esther's plan have been too patient? Will she be too late? Guys, we know better. We know that God is never late. If God decides to step in in time and find a way, then so be it. That's God's will. Glory be to God. But if not, then so be it. Glory be to God. I think a lot of people are in similar positions where they're praying and asking God, to do something, we have to remember that even if He doesn't step in, He's still God. He's still worthy of our love and devotion and respect. And we're still going to honor Him and glorify Him. No matter whether He intervenes in the way that we envision or not, He's still God and worthy of all praise. All right, next time we'll check out the next episode and see what happens. God bless you. Talk to you on Tuesday.